So with all that said, now let's get into our Bible study. <laughs> with the time that we have left, let's, uh, let's, get, let's just get right into the Gospel of Matthew. I just, again, the Lord, sometimes he presses these things on my heart to share with you guys, and I, I got to get it out or else I'm going to explode. Um, so if you haven't already, turn your, turn your Bibles to the Gospel of Matthew, and we're just going to get right into it. So if you're, if you're taking notes, the title of tonight's message is... Uh, it's not insert title here. It's keep it uneven. My notes say insert title here. Uh, keep it uneven. Keep it uneven. So let's read our verses for tonight. Uh, Matthew chapter 38, uh, Matthew chapter 5, verse 38 and 39. It says, you have heard that it was said, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. But I tell you, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. All right, so as we've been studying these past few studies through the Sermon on the Mount, Jesus is, uh, he's clarifying and correcting incorrect interpretations uh, of, of God's law in the Old Testament. Uh, Jesus came to fulfill and to complete and to clarify the law. He didn't come to abolish it. He didn't come to do away with it. He came to accomplish, clarify, perfect, complete, fulfill, all of that. And we find, uh, and, and we find these words, an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, in three different sections in the Old Testament. So we're just going to look through those three different sections. So the first place we see these words uh, is in Exodus chapter 21, verses 22 through 25, and this is what it says. It says, When men get in a fight and hit a pregnant woman so that her children are born prematurely, but there is no injury, the one who hit her must first be fined as the woman's husband demands from him, and he must pay according to the judicial assessment. If there is an injury, then you must give life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, foot for foot, burn for burn, bruise for bruise, wound for wound. So if an injury uh, to a baby occurs as a result of two men acting like knuckleheads, getting into a fight and, uh, around a pregnant woman and the baby gets hurt, uh, there's to be punishment for the men at fault. There is to be a punishment. If the baby dies due to the injury caused by these men, these men lose their lives. If, if the baby loses an eye, these men lose an eye. The guilty party loses an eye. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. The second place that we see these words, eye for eye and tooth for tooth, is in Leviticus 24. In verses 17 through 20, this is what it says. It says, if a man kills anyone, he must be put to death. Whoever kills an animal is to make restitution for it, life for life. If any man inflicts a permanent injury on his neighbor, whatever he has done is to be done to him. Fracture for fracture, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. Whatever injury he inflicted on the person, the same is to be inflicted on him. So easy to understand concept. Uh, any injury that is inflicted on a victim, the guilty party, is to have that same injury inflicted on them. Eye for eye, tooth for tooth. And then finally, in Deuteronomy chapter 19, verses 16 through 21, it says this. If a malicious witness testifies against someone accusing him of a crime, the two people in the dispute are to stand in the presence of the Lord before the priests and the judges in authority at that time. The judges are to make a careful investigation. And if the witness turns out to be a liar who has falsely accused his brother, you must do to him as he intended to do to his brother. You must purge the evil from you. Then everyone else will hear and be afraid, and they will never again do anything evil like this among you. Do not show pity. Life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth, hand for hand, and foot for foot. So in here, if someone took their neighbor to court on false, uh, false charges in an attempt to harm their neighbor, they wanted something bad to happen to their neighbor from the, as a result of these false charges. When the false charges were found out, the court was to do to the false accuser what he wanted to be done to his neighbor. And the Lord said to do this so that others would hear about this and they would be afraid to do the same thing. Like, I'm not doing that because I'm, I'm, I might lose my life. And he says, don't show pity on this evil false accuser. If his intention was for his neighbor to get the death penalty, you give him the death penalty instead. If his intention was for his neighbor to lose a hand, you take one of his hands instead. An eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. Now, all of these verses in the Old Testament that contain eye for eye and tooth for tooth, they're all coming from a judicial context. They're coming from a place, uh, the perspective of a court of law. This is where they're coming from. But the religious leaders in Jesus' day, they took this command from God. They, they took it away from its context of the judicial setting, 
and they applied it to their own personal desires for vengeance when they felt wronged by someone, and they justified their revenge using this verse of an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth. This is not about personal revenge, though. It's not about vengeance. Commentators say that these verses in the Old Testament, they had more to do with restraining revenge. It was more about restraining revenge. God commanded these things in order to make sure that the punishment that was handed down by the civil authorities, that it fit the crime. To make sure that it fit the crime. Don't overpunish. Don't underpunish. The punishment's got to be like Goldilocks. You got to be just right, right? No, well, maybe no. Goldilocks was the hussy who came into the house. It's got to be like the little bear. The little bear is just right. All of his stuff was just right. But life for life, eye for eye, tooth for tooth. But this command had become a justification for taking your own personal revenge. This person did me dirty, so I'm going to go ahead and do them dirty. God commands it. But Jesus offers this clarification instead. He says, don't resist an evildoer. On the contrary, if anyone slaps you on the right cheek, turn the other to him also. Turn the other to him. Now, many have stated that Jesus' words here, they're not saying that we are to open ourselves up to, to violence and evil and, and just let it slide. Just let it happen. You know, just, just, just let all kinds of evil slide. There are many instances in the Bible where something unjust or evil was happening and it wasn't just allowed to happen without repercussions. You know, when Jesus went to the temple and he saw all the money exchangers and, and the hustlers in there selling stuff, he flipped over their tables, he flipped over their money drawers, everything all over the floor in righteous anger. When Peter was acting hypocritical around Gentile believers, whenever Jewish believers would come around, and be like, oh, I don't really hang out with those Gentiles. Paul confronted him and said, hey, you need to stop being a hypocrite. Knock it off. When Paul and Silas were unjustly beaten in public by the Romans without an official trial and then jailed, when the Romans tried to release them the next day in secret because they realized they did something wrong, when they tried to release them secretly, Paul was like, nah, that ain't gonna happen. We're Roman citizens. We didn't get a proper trial. Y'all beat us. Y'all put us in jail. You're not releasing us secretly. Get your boss. He's gonna escort us out of here. So we are to call out evil, and we are to confront evil. And in light of what an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth had become in Jesus' day, which was an excuse, a justification for personal vengeance, Jesus is saying that our heart's posture must not be that of a desire for vengeance. Rather, it should be a posture of humility. We, we, we are not to desire revenge. Personally, we are not to desire revenge. We are not to desire to make things even ourselves. We are to, to desire what Paul writes in Romans chapter 12, verse 19, where he says, friends, do not avenge yourselves. Instead, leave room for God's wrath because it is written, vengeance belongs to me. This is God speaking. I will repay, says the Lord. We don't take our own revenge. That's not what we do. We let God deal with those who have offended us and hurt us and disrespected us. We just continue loving. That's our part. We continue loving. Listen to what Paul says as he continues in Romans 12, verses 20 and 21. He says, but if your enemy is hungry, what? Feed him. If your enemy is hungry, feed him. If he is thirsty, what? Give him something to drink. For in so doing, you will be heaping fiery coals on his head. Do not be conquered by evil, but conquer evil. You conquer evil with good. Man, can that be tough though? Right, Tony? Maybe not for you, but man, can that be tough? I mean, think about a person in your life who has caused you harm. Somebody who has insulted you. Someone who has treated you unfairly. Maybe someone who has even caused you physical harm emotional harm, psychological harm. Think about this person. Jesus is saying, don't even the score. Don't think about evening the score. Don't try to figure out a way to get even. Keep it uneven. 
Keep the score uneven. Leave that to the Lord. Vengeance is his, and you are his child. There will be retribution, but it's not up to you to try to figure out how that's going to happen. It's not up to you. Vengeance is his. You leave that to the Lord. This is not the way of the world, though. This is not the way of the world. The world gets even. The world pays back. The world doesn't even wait to get hit sometimes before they, they hit you back. Sometimes if they feel like the hit is coming, they will preemptively strike. Like, eh, you ain't going to get over on me. But not us. Not us. If you call yourself a believer, if you're a kingdom person, as kingdom people, we are humble. We don't retaliate. Mm -mm. We don't retaliate. We don't strike back. We don't personally take an eye for an eye. Why? Because we're heavenly minded. We are heavenly minded. Colossians chapter three, verses one through three, it says this. So if you have been raised with Christ, if you have been raised with Christ, seek things above. Seek the things above where Christ is, seated at the right hand of God. Set your mind on things above, not on earthly things. For you died, you died. And your life is hidden with Christ in God. We are to be heavenly minded. We are to have an eternal perspective. We are to possess this characteristic of one who is representing another kingdom. Because we are. We are not of this world. We are not of this world. We have been rescued from this world. We've been rescued from this domain of darkness. And we have been transferred into the kingdom of Jesus Christ. That's who we are. And those who belong to his kingdom, they don't hold grudges. They don't get even. They don't seek revenge. We take the L. We take the L in the name of Christ because his glory and his kingdom are much more important than our personal pride and our egos. It's not an easy thing to do. It isn't. It's not an easy thing to do. It's not an easy thing to preach, standing up here talking about how this is how we're supposed to be. I know who I am. This is not an easy thing to preach. This is difficult. I'm standing up here thinking about all the possible situations where I would have to take an L in, in order to be obedient to what Jesus is saying here. In some situations, they're easier than others in my mind. You know, if someone wants to insult me and call me names, that's fine. I dealt with that last week at the Santa Monica Pier. Someone wants to insult me and call me names because I follow Jesus, whatever, no problem. I can take that. No, no issue with that. If someone tries to bring bodily harm to me because I follow Jesus, hey, I think I could take that too, whatever. I've, I've, I've been threatened a few times, whatever, you know, I, I could deal with that. But how far are we supposed to go? How far is this supposed to go? Death? Death? Am I, am, am I supposed to leave my wife a widow? Am I supposed to leave my children fatherless in obedience to this, this command from Jesus? It's a difficult thing to think about. It's very difficult to think about. But I think that death, it's definitely included in, in the options that God has at his disposal for us. Are we ready for this? Am I ready for this? Are you ready for this? There's a story in Acts chapter seven where this guy named Stephen, some of you guys are familiar with this story. Stephen, he's a believer, young believer, and he just starts serving tables you know, at, his, at the fellowship where he was a part of. He's just like, man, these widows need to eat, so I'm, I'm serving food to these widows. And then he gets brought before uh, the religious leaders, and they're like, what are you doing? Because he was doing amazing things in the name of Jesus. Uh, what are you doing? And he began to preach to them from the beginning, the history of, of the Hebrew people, the history of the Israelite people, all the way to Jesus and saying, this Jesus was our Messiah and y'all crucified him. And there's no other name. Like you need to believe in this Jesus because if you don't believe in this Jesus, you're done. This is the salvation that God brought for Israel. This is the King. This is the Holy and Anointed One. This is our Messiah. And what did they do? They grabbed some rocks and they're like, we got to kill this guy. And so they started throwing rocks at him, stoning him to death. And the last thing that happened was Stephen was breathing his last breath. And as he was saying, Lord, forgive them 
Don't charge them with this, with, this, with this evil. Forgive them. Basically, the words of Jesus, forgive them, Father, they know not what they're doing. Now, is everyone called to be a martyr? Is everyone called to, to, for their lives to end in this way, dying for their faith? Is every situation of someone slapping you on the right cheek and then you turning the other cheek supposed to result in your eventual death and martyrdom for the gospel? I don't think so. I don't think so. So, so why didn't Stephen run away? Why didn't he run away? Why, why, why did he not try to spare his own life in this situation? Why didn't he try to get away once he realized like, oh snap, it's about to get real, let me go. Why? Why? Well, we're not told, but I would imagine that he was convinced. He was convinced by the Holy Spirit inside of him. He was convinced that this was going to be the way that he died. This was going to be the way that he suffered for Jesus. He knew that this wasn't a runaway type of situation. This was a time to carry my cross and deny myself situation to the highest degree. In the Gospels of Matthew, Mark, and Luke, you read the account of when Jesus asks his disciples, he's like, who who do people say that I am? And they tell him, he's like, okay, well, who do you say that I am? He asks his disciples. And Peter confesses, you're the Messiah. You're the son of God. That's who you are. And after Peter gives that response, Jesus begins to tell them that he's going to have to be treated unfairly. He's going to be brought before the religious leaders. He's going to be killed. He's going to have to suffer. And then Peter responds by rebuking Jesus. Like, Jesus, you better calm down. Like, we're not going to let that happen to you. That, that's not going to happen. God forbid that happens. And then Jesus says to Peter, get behind me, Satan. Get behind me. And it's after this scenario, it's after this dialogue that happens that in the three gospels, they record Jesus telling his disciples, if anyone wants to follow after me, if anybody wants to follow me, if anybody wants to believe in me, let him deny himself. Let her deny herself. Take up your cross. Take up your cross daily and follow me. For whoever wants to save their life, they will lose it. But whoever loses their life because of me, they will save it. Now we can definitely interpret these words of Jesus. We can interpret them metaphorically, right? We could definitely do that and say that we need to give up the things in our lives that are like sinful, the things that are ruling our lives, these these things that are idols in our lives that keep us from obeying God. You know, give up your life to follow Jesus, of course. And there's nothing wrong with that. We can, we can take that metaphorically and apply that perfectly fine, great. But we can't escape. We can't escape the plain meaning of Jesus's words, especially in the context of Jesus talking about his death on a cross that was gonna take place. And then Jesus says, if you wanna follow him, that you need to take up your own cross, your own instrument of death and follow him, even if it leads to physical death in his name. Are you ready for this? Is this a possibility in your mind? Is this something that you have given any thought to? Let me tell you, when you're facing death for your faith, not that I've ever experienced this, but I would imagine when you're facing death for your faith, I would imagine that you're definitely not looking at your brother or your sister next to you as they are also facing death for their faith in Jesus and thinking, I hope they're reformed. They they better not believe in post-tribulation theology, like, I'm not saying that obeying the Lord in this matter of turning the other cheek should result in death. That's not what I'm saying. The point is that we are not to have a heart of retaliation. We're not to have a heart of revenge, a heart of vengeance. 
which is the heart that the the religious leaders had in Jesus's day. That's what Jesus was coming against. We are to leave vengeance to the Lord. We are to take up our cross daily and follow him. And Jesus could call us to this kind of living because he was the ultimate example of this, was he not? He was the ultimate example of this. He took up his cross. Hebrews 12, 2, it says that for the joy that lay before him, he endured the cross. The joy that lay before him, the glory of his father, the salvation of his people. Jesus was heavenly minded. He had the eternal perspective that gave him the strength and the endurance to go through what he went through. He was beaten and flogged. His body was ripped open. His body was torn apart. It was not like your mom with a belt. Like he was ripped open. He was taken to a wooden cross where he would be nailed through his wrists and through his feet. And he would hang there, be attached to the cross until he suffocated and breathed his final breath. And why did he do this? Why? Ultimately for the glory of his own name, which, would, which is the same thing as the glory of his father. But he also did it for you. He also did it for you because he just, he loves you so much. He did it for you. If he did not go to that cross and die and then rise again, you would have no hope of being saved from hell and being saved from God's wrath, being saved from his anger. Your sins separated you from God and God's justice demanded that you be punished forever for your sins committed against him. But in his love and mercy for you, in his love and mercy for you, he decided to satisfy his justice, not by punishing you, but by punishing his one and only son instead. Jesus took all of your punishment. He took all of your punishment so that you wouldn't have to be punished. He died, he rose, and now he's sitting on his throne. He's the conqueror. And now the Holy Spirit is using his people to tell those who don't know Jesus, to tell those who are caught up in this sin-filled world, to tell those who are slaves to sin, to tell those who are living in active lifestyles that are completely against God, even though they're convinced that it's not, The Holy Spirit is using his people to let these people know that though your your sinful lifestyle, it may be pleasurable to you, and though there may not be any victims because of this lifestyle that you're living, he is using his people to let you know, regardless of how you feel about your sin or how much pleasure it brings to you, it's sinful, it's against God, he hates it, you're going to be punished for it, but there is a God in heaven who loves you, and he died to take the punishment for those sins that you love so dearly. He died to take the punishment for those sins that you see as harmless because no one's hurt by it and it fulfills you, but it's killing you. He died for that. He did it so that we can be forgiven, so that we can be saved and we can go to heaven and we can be with him forever. But forgiveness and salvation and heaven, they only come through one name, and that's Jesus the Messiah, the holy and anointed one. Acts 4.12, it says, There is salvation in no one else, for there is no other name under heaven given to people by which we must be saved. Is God speaking to someone tonight? That's what I want to know. Is God speaking to someone tonight? Is there anyone in here who has never received this gift of salvation. We got a lot of new people. I don't know y'all. Is there anybody in here who has not received that free gift of salvation? Is God speaking to you? Does anybody want to receive that gift? So at this time, I'm going to invite anybody. I want to pray for you. So if there's anybody in here who has never received that gift of salvation, never received that gift of salvation, and you want that gift of salvation, I want you to raise your hand so I can pray for you. Not for any other reason. I'm not gonna make you repeat a prayer. I'm not gonna have you come forward. I'm not gonna have you do anything. I wanna raise your, I want you to raise your hand so we could pray for you. So anybody. I'm gonna give you guys a few seconds if there's if the Lord is speaking to anybody. God's been doing amazing things. 
People have been coming and getting saved. All right. Well, right on. Well, praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. If we're all family, that's great. If there's somebody who, who felt the call and they just, they rejected it, then that, that's fine. You know, the, those are the numbers. <laughs> it's the law of averages. But I do want to say something that I told you guys I would say every single week. For those of you who do claim Christ, for those of you who claim to be believers in Jesus Christ, I just want to share something with you. All throughout the New Testament, when people have, have, have come into a saving faith in Jesus Christ, when people heard the gospel and, and people responded with, what should I do? What do I need to do? I believe this message. What do I need to do? They were told a few things. They were told first that they need to believe. They need to believe in this gospel. Believe that Jesus Christ died for your sins. Believe that he was the ultimate sacrifice for your sins and that that, that sacrifice was enough. And, it, and that sacrifice was enough. It was, that was evidenced by the fact that he rose again from the dead. That tomb is empty. So you just believe in that message that Jesus died for your sins. That's the first thing. Second thing they were told, repent. Repent. That means to turn away. Turn away from your sinful lifestyle that you used to love so much, this sinful lifestyle that you were enslaved to. Turn away from it. Change your mind about it. Change your thinking about it. God says premarital sex is sin. All right, I don't necessarily believe it, but I'm going to change my mind on it because that's what he said. That's what it means to repent. God says that living a homosexual lifestyle is sin. I don't necessarily believe that because I feel so strongly about it, but I'm going to believe what God said and I'm going to turn away from it because I believe God. He says, believe. They said, repent. And they said, as a result of these things, you will be born again. The Holy Spirit will come to live inside of you. And after that, now you're a newborn baby. You are born again. You're a baby now. You're just, you're an infant. Now it's time to eat. Now it's time to grow. And what that means is now it's time to get into your word. Now it's time to read the Bible. If you don't have a Bible, we got Bibles, New Testaments up here for you. Come get one. It's time to grow. It's time to eat. Get into the Bible. Get into Bible studies. Hear more of the word. Grow and grow and grow. And after that, not after that, but also in addition to you being a newborn baby believer, if you are in Christ, now you're also known as a sheep. And sheeps, sheeps, sheep are part of a sheepfold who are under a shepherd. What does that mean? Make yourself a part of a church. If you are a believer in here, you claim the name of Christ, you are a sheep. And now it's time to make yourself a part of a sheepfold. If you've been a believer for years and you don't have a home church, it's time to stop playing around. Make yourself a part of a body. Make yourself a part of a sheepfold under a shepherd. That's what we're called to do. Another thing, we're also called body parts. We're members of Christ's body. What does that mean? You've been called to do something. My finger is my finger because it does things. You are in this body. You are a member of this body because you're supposed to be doing something. So do it. As you grow in the Lord, seek the Lord. What am I supposed to do, Lord? And maybe you don't know. Okay, well, then start by cleaning toilets. I don't know what I'm supposed to do. Okay, well, start by making yourself available for something. And then the Lord will begin to speak to you through your brothers and sisters, through these other little sheepies, and he will talk to you. That's what they were told. So with all that said, let's pray. Father, thank you so much for tonight. God, I pray that you would continue to speak to your people. God, I pray that you would use this word that was shared tonight, God, and that you would, you would change us, Lord, that you would make us more like your son, that you would help us, help us to be obedient. Man, you, you, you're... Your standards are so high, Lord. God, if, we get, if, if somebody strikes us on the cheek, you tell us to turn the other cheek to them. There have been people throughout history, God, that your people who have, who have taken that to death. And that may or may not happen to us, Lord, but may we have hearts that are willing. May we have hearts that are fully surrendered to you that if, if, if push comes to shove and that's what it was gonna take for us to glorify you, God, that we would do it willingly. Let us not be proud. Let us not have proud hearts and say, oh no, I would do it. I would die. Peter had that same heart and then he denied the Lord. God, help us to be humble. Help us to love people even when they strike us, even when they insult us. Help us to pray for them, to feed them if they're hungry, to give them water if they're thirsty and help us to leave vengeance up to you. I pray all these things in Jesus' name, amen.